Hey, photographers, welcome to the Boca Podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Holritz, and really I'm just here to help you build a sustainable photography business. That certainly means helping you improve your photographic skills and enabling you to become a stronger business owner, but it also means helping you work more efficiently so you don't get burnt out in the long run. We are sponsored by PhotographersEdit.com, custom photo editing for the professional photographer, and Milu.com, that's M-I-I-L-U.com, the simplest way to create and manage timelines and shot lists for the events you're photographing. All right, let's get into today's episode. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're back for another Boca Podcast episode. And I'm, you can probably hear the excitement in my voice. I'm excited for this conversation with Caroline. She and I have been talking for a few minutes here before we started recording. Caroline Axvig is here with me. And um, well, first of all, Caroline, thank you for making time for all of us. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. And see, for those of you listening in, I already commented on this to Caroline, but you probably heard this just wonderful, I, I, radio voice is kind of a dated way to say it. I guess we have to say podcast voice now, but Caroline's <laughs> got a wonderful podcast voice and and just very easy to listen to. So I think this is going to be a really fun conversation for everybody, not only for that reason, but ultimately because we're going to get into a what is genuinely a fascinating topic to me. I don't know that we've ever really touched on this, at least in much detail, uh, the idea of a photography business model centered around a subscription service. And Caroline is going to share what she's been doing in that regard here in just a little bit. But as we normally do, we're going to start off with a series of questions, Caroline, the first of which has to do with brand position, the unique value proposition that hopefully we're bringing to our market as photography business owners. What is that for you in the greater Boston area? Okay. So my brand position, I feel like I was one of those people who said we like, I don't know if I was meaning the royal we or whatever when I said that, but okay. it's just me and my business. So I feel like I just changed my brand position a little while ago because I was like, we create. I'm like, no, there's no we. It's just me. <laughs> so my brand position statement is I create on-brand lifestyle imagery and provide brand coaching for small businesses, bloggers, and influencers. I believe that my combination of creativity and community will help you grow your audience and reach your goals. Wow. Okay. And that's pretty straightforward. I like the clarity of that. Where is that on the homepage of your site? I'm, I'm scrolling right now, actually. I think it's on, it's under my like little about me section. So I, I know you always talk about things above the fold, but if you scroll just a little below the fold, yeah. there's a picture of me and I think that's right. To yes. The right of it. Got it right here. Okay, cool. Yeah. So for everybody listening, if you, if you want to take a look along with me, if you go to carolinethephotographer.co, by the way, I also love your, your domain name. I thought that was great when I was doing prep for the show. I was like, oh, that's cool. Like, call yourself the photographer, Caroline, the photographer dot <laughs> co is, is pretty awesome. Did you, was there anything in particular that made you choose that as your domain name? Um, I feel like I went through like a million different iterations of my business name for forever. And then I was about to, I was in a really serious relationship and I felt like we were about to get engaged and get married. And so I didn't want my business name to be attached to my last name at all. Ah. Cause I was like, I knew that I wanted to change my last name when I got married. And so I was like, ah, maybe we just don't even mess with it. Like people would refer to me. I worked as a, um, as a campus photographer at a small liberal arts college in Minnesota and, on, around campus, I'd be, oh, Caroline, she's the photographer. And I was like, all right, well, that's simple enough. <laughs> Caroline, the photographer, it is. I love it. I mean, it, and, and honestly, I don't know that I've heard any other photographer in 20 years call themselves that or name their business that. <laughs> that. So I, I love it because it's actually unique. It stands out. Um, I got a kick out of it when I when I saw that. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I see your position statement here. I create on-brand lifestyle imagery and provide brand coaching for small businesses, bloggers, and influencers. Um, and it's, it's simple, it's straightforward. And are you focused there in the Boston market or does it reach beyond that area? Yeah. So mostly just greater Boston, a little bit up into Southern New Hampshire, but mostly, mostly Massachusetts. And I know that brand, uh, and lifestyle or brand lifestyle imagery, this is something that's become more and more popular in the photo industry as a genre. Uh, but in addition to that, you're also providing coaching for small businesses. How have you developed that element of your business? It kind of happened, I was going to say by accident, but let's say organically. Um, okay. I what, kind of when working with some 
bloggers and influencers mostly, I kept running across the fact that a lot of them were trying to start this as a side hustle, as like a small business, as a way to make money. But they were kind of realizing that the people in their life who did not do internet stuff for a living thought that this was a little ridiculous and they were getting tired of their partners making fun of them every time they had to take photos of them, like, you know, all that sort of stuff. And so through conversations and shoots with them, I sort of found myself in the role of encourager for them to be like, nope, what you're doing is a valid thing. This is a small business. Like you're starting here, I guess, is a brand that you're starting. Um, And so kind of coming from that point of like believing in what they're doing from day one and encouraging them through something that a lot of people make fun of. (laughs) Um, I love that. There's all those accounts like influencers in the wild and everything like that. And, you know, there's like funny stuff for sure. But um, it really was awesome to be able to support people kind of from day one deciding they wanted to do this. So from there, I just started offering that as part of um, as part of my photo services, like every quarter we set some goals for them and um, kind of work backwards on how they can achieve those goals um, for each quarter. And it turned into a, something I could actually make money doing. I like that idea, though. Of, I'm still stuck on this word encourager. And I don't think I've heard a photographer frame it that way before. It's it's I, I do this myself. And I think that's why it resonates with me. Like I'll do this mm-hmm. with um, you know, my girlfriend's son's a basketball player, for example, and and I just I get excited for him and with him. And my son is a saxophone player, and I'm I'm encouraging him um, because I see the potential and I know what he can accomplish. And there's so many possibilities. And I mean, it, certainly business owners, whether they're already in business or they're talking about the possibility of a business venture. I get excited when I see opportunity and I I like to encourage other people. I think there's just there's something that's so I don't know if fulfilling is the right word. But it's just so exciting and and fun to to be able to be the cheerleader for that person, to see potential in them and to encourage that. Totally. Yeah, I 100% agree. That's really cool. Okay, so do you build that that part of your service in as like a package or an additional service, like a la carte that they would just choose? Hey, I I would also like consulting uh, along with the photography. Yeah. So um, when I have someone inquire, um, I kind of walk them through. There are two paths you can take if you're going with a, I also offer like single branding or um, like content creation sessions. But if you're going with a monthly or quarterly package, you can decide if you want to do photos only or if you want to do photos and brand coaching. Um, So they decide at the beginning and then we kind of split from there. That's really cool. Okay. And and like pricing wise, I'm going to click over to that page now just to take a look. But do you have pricing there on the page or how, how do you structure the pricing for something like that? Yeah. So um, actually, if you go down to like a, about halfway down the influencers and small business page, yeah. there's a little investment section. So I see it for, I mean, I only add, I think it's like $50 ish more every month for the brand coaching stuff. I feel like part of that is because I am I'm not, I I hate it when people are, uh, well, I don't hate it. I feel like I say imposter syndrome and I feel like I hear that in our industry so much and I am trying to not put my insecurities on imposter syndrome. Okay. (laughs) But I feel like I don't have a ton of experience actually like coaching people through stuff like this. And so I feel like charging a ton extra for it um, isn't where I'm at right now, but probably next year I'll be able to kind of bump it from there. But so if you're doing a, like a three month contract with just photos, it's two twenty five dollars a month. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're doing photos and branding stuff, it's two seventy five dollars a month. Well, that's super generous of you. And, and I totally understand what you're talking about. I think there's some value if, you know, I mean, it's easy, even for me on the podcast, I, I understand principles that drive or that can drive strong businesses. It's easy for me to talk about it. It's another thing to do it. Mm. I've obviously I've been a photographer for 10 plus years. So I have that experience. I've started other companies. I have that experience. And and actually I'm getting ready to start a photography brand back up in addition to launching uh, or relaunching a, a, an additional business. So I'm, I'm certainly doing, uh, but it's also... I, being able to have a conversation, whether it's myself with our listeners uh, and commenting as kind of an outsider, if you will, somebody from looking from the outside in, not actually mm-hmm. with blinders on in the business, but from standing from the outside and being able to comment on their business, I think it's helpful, whether I'm doing that on a large scale with a podcast or yourself, myself, any others have the opportunity to be able to be an objective perspective mm-hmm. and lend a little bit of that to somebody who 
especially those who are newer business owners that are just kind of overwhelmed and like, I don't know which direction to go next. Do I do this thing and that thing to have somebody from the outside say, hey, you know what? You might just think about this. It could be yeah. super, super valuable for the business. And so I, I, I certainly wouldn't minimize that, but I also understand where you're coming from. Yeah. And I mean, and I very, I very much agree with that because I have a friend who we kind of provide that service for each other. Like I, even though this is stuff that I teach people and um, encourage people in, I still need someone to someone objective from the outside of my business to look in and say, Hey, like this would be a really cool thing if you kept doing this, or you've brought this thing up a bunch of different times. It sounds like it's important to you. Let's figure out how to, how to get you there. So that's cool. Well, I I know that for our listeners, we spent a little bit of time on on that question, but I think it's this is an interesting additional stream of income that you might be able to consider for local companies mm. uh, if you feel like I think it's super important to be a good communicator in order for this to be a, a strong possibility for your business. I feel like Caroline, just from our conversation already, you're you're a great communicator, so you've got that strength behind you, and that enables you to be able to more effectively help other businesses. But it's something for our listeners to consider for sure. So I appreciate you sharing your perspective, and we're going to come back, of course, to this concept of a membership, a subscription service, in just a little bit. But let me keep moving. Talk to me about customer experience. And for your experience in business as a photographer, what has been one of the most important principles driving a great customer experience? Mm. I think that really getting to know your customer, like a big C customer, like your um, like your, who your ideal client is and stuff like that. But then also getting to know each individual customer for me, because I work with the same people over and over again every month and every quarter. Um, so really getting to know who they are and who like getting to know their kids' names, investing in them as a person, um, interacting with their content that they post on Instagram and stuff and just kind of really showing up for them um, in a couple different ways beyond just just the contracted part interaction um, yeah together yeah. yeah okay so but when i and it's, it's certainly a great recommendation but i'm curious on a very tangible very specific level if you will what does that look like for you when you talk about getting to know your customer and we'll go with the capital c one here because you know this is a point of conversation that comes up quite a bit for business owners this idea that you need to be able to get to know your customer and then speak their language to effectively market toward them how do you mm. do that um, I like phone calls. I feel like I communicate so much better, you know, pre pandemic in person, we, I would try to meet everybody for coffee before they signed any contracts or okay. anything like that. But, um, you know, now I make sure that I'm doing fo- like phone calls or FaceTimes with everybody just cause I feel like you are able to go off on little personal tangents and stuff on calls in a way that you're not able to do through email or it doesn't happen naturally, um, through written communication. So, True. um, I would say just spending a good bit of time talking with them and uh, getting to know, getting to know their why, why they're starting this business, why they're um, starting this blog. And I feel like that really helps in the future. I feel like it really helps my kind of understanding of who they are and um, what's important to them. Yeah. That context makes all the difference in the world. And then of course you have the opportunity to develop personal rapport as well. It helps them feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. It translates to the, the photography session. Um, That's yeah. I, the in-person, interaction. Um, I, you know, I've realized that I, it was already a big deal to me just for my so-called personality type. I enjoy connecting with people in person and I've been confused and I've talked about it on the podcast before. I've been so confused by how many photographers seem to find whatever excuse possible to not actually make the effort to get out from behind Facebook and go meet for coffee or go have a meal, Mm -hmm. even if it means driving a little ways to do so. Uh, because I just find so much enjoyment in that and and that in-person contact where you actually get to look the other person in the eye, see their expression in response to what it is that you're saying and then play off that, uh, that, that rapport that you can build as a result is incredible as well. Has Zoom been kind of weird to adjust to? I mean, I know we've been doing this for, for a while now, but was that weird to, to make that switch? And is there anything in particular you've done to let Zoom still be almost as effective? I try to call them coffee dates still. So I feel like that sort of like sets the tone a little bit. Oh, um, yeah. Where I'm like, all right, we're like both having our coffee or whatever, Bev, if it's in the evening, like we'll have a beer together or something. Yeah. And I actually do that just in my personal life too. I, I've started doing like Monday coffee, more like coffee dates in the morning with whoever wants to chat and hang out and stuff. I feel like I'm an extrovert. And so the pandemic has been difficult in a couple different ways. <laughs> so I'm um, just trying to 
to keep that interaction alive and yeah. just kind of make people like, I feel like you allow people to feel comfortable and have help them show up as themselves. And um, I feel like that always leads to, that's like a good place to start for a good conversation is having everyone feel comfortable and excited to be there. I, I love how you talk about setting the tone though, by calling it in this case, a coffee date or a beer date or whatever it might be setting the tone with that because yeah just saying hey can we get on zoom to meet just at this point is almost an exhausting concept we're doing that non-stop right <laughs> you're like again cool. i know yeah sure I haven't spent six hours on zoom yet today perfect <laughs> <laughs> That's I love that a lot. Well, speaking of of Zoom, somebody that fortunately you don't have to just have conversation on Zoom with is your husband Elliot. You mentioned Elliot to me before we get started, and you know when it comes to running a business and then also making time for family, and then actually for that matter, making time for yourself, juggling all of that simultaneously can be a bit of a challenge. Is there something that has enabled you to do that more effectively? A, a principle, a workflow principle, idea, technique that's been helpful? Mm. Um. I feel like I just started doing this recently because I just hit my own little, I feel like in busy season of 2020 was when I kind of hit my like busy crisis point where I was like, okay, we really need to take a step back and make sure that we are (laughs) taking care of ourselves and our relationships first. Mm. So I have put like a big like a bar over Sunday. So Sunday is a no shoot day, a no email day, a no nothing day. So we um, are just spending the whole day together hanging out and stuff. And um, I feel like that's a very, I feel like that's a very simple concept (laughs) to like everybody, like, of course, weekends and everything. But I feel like as a photographer, especially when you're working with people who have nine to five jobs, you you have to do some shoots and stuff on weekends. So um, at least protecting one weekend day every week is really important to me so that we have that time to reset and connect and kind of put aside the constant responding to emails and DMs and texts and everything. Well, and to that point, do you turn off notifications on Sunday then even on on your phone so you're not constantly dealing with an email or a DM from a client? Um, I mostly just leave my phone in our bedroom. Love it. Um, Yeah. So, I mean, obviously I'll go in and we do, we do lots of Zoom, like family Zoom calls and stuff on Sunday too, to catch up with our families and stuff. But for That's the most cool. part, um, I just kind of leave my phone wherever. Isn't it uh, so charging. to do that? <laughs> it is amazing, actually. I have been thinking so much about taking the month of February and just not using my phone. Like, like getting a flip phone or something like that? Like, yeah. Or, I mean, or just, you know, deleting like the email and Instagram apps off yeah. of my phone and being like, I'll go take one hour every day and do stuff on my computer and then that's that for that. So I think that's a brilliant concept. It's a great idea in theory. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Check back with me in February. <laughs> well, there are a couple of things that could potentially get in the way of, of that or not get in the way, but like make that a little bit more challenging, you know, hashtag first world problems. But mm. if we have, if, I know there's FOMO plays in, right? So photographers might be worried that if they're not responding to email right away or DMs right away, that somehow is going to mean that they miss out on potential business. But the reality, of course, is that we can structure our business model and and do the work the rest of the year in such a way that will enable us to have plenty of business without being concerned about missing a couple of messages here and there, especially if you're you're going to be checking email anyway, you're still going to be notified. You're just not responding in 30 seconds or constantly yeah. buzzed every time somebody sends you a message. Uh, yeah. I actually read something in a book recently where they were talking about how our culture of like when someone reaches out to you, you feel an immediate responsibility to respond to them in that moment because that moment worked for them to reach out to you instead of waiting until it's you are ready to respond to them. Yeah. And I think about that all the time mm-hmm. because I feel like condensing all of my client communication into like the first and last hour like working hour of each day would probably be a great thing for me. So even if people are texting me stuff all day, like I'll just respond to everything at night um, before I go to bed. And so I would like to put that into practice in my business, I think, just to kind of free myself from the, from the tether. Well, and that brings up, it's a great segue actually to my other point about, you know, where, where this might kind of, kind of create a challenge, if you will, for photographers, there's the FOMO piece, but then there's also the the habit piece, right? Like we're so used mm. to, and, and I'll include myself in this, we're so used to reaching for the phone, whether there's a notification or not, like we just kind of go there 
it becomes a crutch and yeah. we get it, it and ultimately in some weird way like a, a comfort zone of sorts and the idea of putting that down and not having it might just kind of throw us off a little bit but i i mean i've found that even just leaving my phone in the car when i go into the grocery store in and of itself is just super freeing and i, I don't it sounds ridiculous but man to no, not feel like I i'm totally- Totally get what you're saying. I like left my phone at home to go get coffee the other day, and yeah. I was like, "Oh my goodness, who is she? Look at this mature woman leaving her phone behind." And I like did just didn't have it with me for like 20 minutes, and I was driving anyway, so it yeah. was not a big deal. But when I got home, I felt very proud of myself. So yeah, <laughs> I'll take I, it. <laughs> I think we all need to practice that in some way, whether it's a month long in February or you know 30 minutes. I mean, it's just it, it really doesn't make a big difference, and. Um, I, I think there's going to be opportunity in future podcast episodes too to get into. Maybe we'll have a, a psychologist on or something and talk about the, you know, that constant drive for the the dop- dopamine hit that we get mm-hmm. from a notification or just reaching f- yeah. for our phone, being able to have entertainment for thirty seconds, you know, for whatever the reason, because we can't just sit with ourselves and be quiet or think or just be. Uh, it's it's a problem. It's something that I've struggled with too, and and so maybe we can get into that in another episode. But let's keep going. I, I, talk to me about delegation. Um, this is something, of course, related to time management. Is this is this a concept that you've experimented with in your business? Have you found any success with it? Um, I just started doing some delegating like a month ago, actually. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, do um, tell. I, I had gotten to the point in my business where I was like, okay, I'm either going to need to hire an assistant. Or I'm going to need to hire somebody to come into my business and help me get organized in all my systems. I am not an organized person by nature, okay. which I feel like is always like, it feels like a, like a dirty little secret to say in front of other entrepreneurs, because I feel like so many entrepreneurs are like very detail oriented and everything. And I am not. I am a big picture person and organizing things doesn't come naturally to me. So I actually hired one of my friends who um, does a lot of really cool work in that space. And she and I sat down for an entire day and we wrote down a list of every single thing I do in my business, how we can kind of batch work different things together. What things can I have her do for like five or 10 hours a week? What things um, do I hate doing? that I just put off, put off, put off and would just be very easy for someone else to do in like an hour. (laughs) Um, And just kind of what things can I automate and just try to streamline what my day-to-day looks like a little bit. And um, it feels like such a relief, honestly. Uh, It feels like such a weight off my shoulders and it was such a worthy investment in my like scalability, I think, as a business owner. Okay, so within that, talk to me. The, the biggest question I've been asking our guests in regards to delegation is how they've learned to more effectively communicate when it comes to handing anything off. Is Was that a bit of a challenge for you? Had you been in a management position in the past, working for another company or whatever it might be, where you'd, you'd had that experience telling, we can say telling somebody what to do, but ultimately communicating what it is that you want done to somebody else in a way that they understand it so that they can carry it out effectively. What yeah. was that experience like for you? Um, I had I had three or four student photographers working under me when I worked at that college. Okay. Um, and so I feel like I got like a pretty good I got a good overview of what I do really well and what I need to work on as a delegator and as a manager. Um, So I feel like this time around, I'm feeling a lot more confident in, I know that sending a voice memo, I definitely think better and process better out loud instead of on paper. So sending an email with a bunch of written out tasks isn't my strong point at all. But if I send a voice memo, she can then kind of break everything down into little tasks. And that's how we also do. She does some blog post stuff for me too. So what I'll do is I'll just sit down and talk about whatever topic we're going to write the post about for like two or three minutes, send her the thing, and then she can write it up and kind of fill in and stuff like that. And that works so well for me. So I feel like part of it is understanding what your communication style is um, and then finding somebody who receives the way that you communicate well Hmm. because i feel like it could be difficult for somebody for me like if i just sent them like a a voice memo and i was like great now you have it go write us something please (laughs) that's an interesting way to think about it though too like instead of finding somebody that you need to spend extensive time training 
to learn how to understand. Just find somebody from the beginning that that gets you. <laughs> that, I mean, and that is also part of it. We've been friends for almost 10 years. Or oh, something. that's cool. So I think she has a really, yeah. So we know each other very well and she knows what my, uh, what my strong points and weak points are. And so we happen to kind of match each other very well or kind of, you know, she has the strengths that I don't and I have the strengths she doesn't. And so it's really a good partnership, I think. Now, this is a bit of a nerdy question, but do you... One of the things that I like about text communication, whether via email or messenger or Slack or whatever it might be, is that I can go back to it. I can reference mm. it, whether I, because I need it because my memory tends to be pretty terrible or I need it for the sake of record. You know, if I'm if I'm having some type of business conversation with somebody, I need to be able to say, hey, look, this is what you said. What about that? Um, I, I just like to have those records to go back to with voice communication. I understand the benefit of it. And, and frankly, I, I like conversation as well, whether it's recorded, pre-recorded or you know, in person. But do you have has it been an issue where you can't easily go back and reference that voice memo? Um, no, we use Asana um, to send things back and forth. Okay. So I just upload the voice memo to whatever task ah. that we have assigned in Asana. So we have all of them cool. um, online. So That's we, don't, smart. we don't end up losing them that way. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Well, let me ask you another question. And this is about reading and maybe it could be listening too. If you listen to books or you read books or maybe it's podcasts, has there been a particularly helpful or inspirational self-help book or business book or podcast in the last few years? Um, pretty much anything by Brene Brown. I love, um, <laughs> but I think specifically I love, I read deep work twice this year. Ah. Um, and I really feel like that is a, a concept that I've been working really hard on, including in my business. Um, just the idea of turning off all other, like stop trying to multitask and just try to focus on one single task and do it quickly, efficiently, and using all of the good parts of my brain on one thing instead of bouncing between, bouncing from task to task. So I feel like I talk about that book all the time. <laughs> yeah. As much as I'm a workflow junkie and nerd and whatever other descriptor you want to use there, I that is still something that I have to, to continue to do. I need to do a better job of is is focus, even if it's for a short segment of time. And this is something I've been thinking about, actually, is just working in like 20 minute or 30 minute segments. Mm. And, and of course, that shorter time frame, I tend to work better in shorter stints anyway. But then that gives me even less excuse to, to allow myself to be distracted by something else, just focus in on one thing, go hard for 20, 30 minutes, and then you know move, take a five minute break and then move to the next thing. Deep Work by Cal Newport. We'll actually link to that in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. Uh, I haven't had the opportunity to read that yet, but it definitely sounds compelling. Yeah, it's been it's been really good. Um, also, Profit First, I think it's by Mike Mikowitz. I'm not sure if that's how you say his last name, but that is a really cool business uh, book, business book, kind of just talking about how how to make sure that your business is profitable from day one. You mean you actually and, want to make money, Caroline? I mean, you know, that would be the goal, I think, <laughs> <laughs> if at all possible. One would think, yeah. <laughs> um, so I feel like that was an interesting, I feel like I read so much more in the like, certainly in the more like self-help, like creative uh, business sphere. So mm -hmm. having something that was so very clear and concise, that book is short and sweet and packed full of good stuff. Cool. Well, we'll link to both of those in the show notes. And for anybody listening in, just a reminder that Haley, our producer, puts all that information together, links to resources, talking points from the episodes in the show notes, bocapodcast.com. And do take advantage of that as a resource because, uh, well, first of all, Haley just does a really great job putting it all together. I mean, if you think about the fact that we've got well, I've recorded, um, what is it now, 400 and, or close to 470 episodes. Uh, there is a ton of content there on the podcast blog. So those of you listening in, make sure you take advantage of it. And let's get to our primary point of conversation for today, which is this business model that we were talking about. And for anybody listening in, if you go to carolinethephotographer.co slash membership, um, the top of the page there, you can actually see it. And it's called the CTP Content Membership. And it just says, let's tell your brand story. This membership is for bloggers, influencers, creative entrepreneurs, and small business owners. We work together to create fresh and timely content to engage and grow your audience. The content membership is, number one, a subscription photography service. Secondly, one-on-one -on -one brand coaching. And then thirdly, a community of creatives. 
we're going to get into the details of this membership service, but talk to me about how you even landed on this model in the first place. Yeah, it was, I mean, it really has developed over time. Back in 2018, um, my husband and I lived in Fargo, North Dakota, and I had shot with a couple local influencers just kind of on the side for fun, kind of like building up my portfolio because I knew we were going to be moving back to Boston um, in May of 2019. And I was like, I feel like working with them was it always kept me on my toes. You always have to come up with something new and we're shooting very consistently um, to cover any new uh, like sponsored content they had coming in or gifted items or anything. Um, And you always want to be able to share, showcase those things in a new and exciting way. And um, I really got hooked into those kinds of fast paced thinking on your toes shoots. And so when I got to Boston, I reached out to, I pretty much cold called like, I don't know, 25 to 30 different influencers and bloggers um, in the area. And I was just like, Hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. Like, I would love to shoot with you. I know you probably need professional photo content every month. Like, you know, having photos that aren't just taken on your iPhone can help you, you know, give brands and stuff that you're working with higher quality uh, content and stuff in your in your paid gigs and stuff. And so I got a few responses back and I started working with a couple people sort of mid 2019. So they tag me in every photo that they post. And so my name just kept popping up in front of other bloggers and influencers in the area. And so I was like, all right, we need to formalize this into a, (laughs) into something instead of having to explain it to every new person every single time. And so I kind of came up with Uh, the subscription model. So basically they can sign up for three, six or 12 month subscriptions. And there's like a little discount for if they subscribe for longer Um, and they get a one hour photo shoot every month. Um, And we do a big planning call and really kind of make sure that we're making the most of every minute that we're together. And yeah, it really, I think it just hit, it It found a market that wasn't being served by a regular like portrait photography model. And, and it's been really fun. I think I have the coolest job in the world. That, well, and it's cool to actually be able to say that too. You know, like it's one thing, I know photographers can get jaded. It seems like wedding photographers in particular, after a certain amount of time of shooting weddings and just going and working hard and kind of beating your body up a little bit. Uh, it can it can be tiring, and you hear these kind of cynical comments from wedding photographers about their experience. It's fun to hear you excited and to actually hear that in your voice about this particular genre. And it sounds like an interesting model. You mentioned the so three, six, twelve month options, one hour shoot, of course, in uh, collaboration with a, a planning session, a planning call uh, to make sure to make most of that time frame. How many images are you delivering per shoot in that case? Um, I'm delivering like 50 to 75 and I know that's a wild amount for what regular, I feel like what you do in regular portrait photography, but because everybody, especially if you are a blogger and influencer and you're posting all of your stuff on Instagram, um, everybody has, you know, the, the filter that they put over their images so that all of that, their whole feed looks cohesive. And I decided pretty early on that I was just not going to care if people did that, because I want them to feel free to use my services and then also feel free to fill in the gaps with their own like iPhone or DSLR photography that they're doing on their own. And so the way to do that and to make it all look cohesive is to be able to put your, um, put your preset or whatever on all of the photos. So I don't end up doing a ton of editing work. So mostly I'm looking for you know, the best looking images. And then I'll do like, like obviously color corrections. And then if there's any like major, I don't know if you like happen to have like a big zit that day, like I'll get rid of it and stuff. But most for the most part, I'm not doing super in-depth detailed edits the way that I would with like a senior portrait session or something like that. So it takes a lot less time um, to process each shoot, which is good because I do a two business day turnaround for each shoot. And when you when you kind of let go of that control, you're talking about not worrying about if somebody puts a filter on and ultimately, of course, in that case, changes the look of your images. I, I'm sure you can imagine you probably have even heard it directly in conversation for other photographers being like, oh, my word, how could you let them do that? And that's yeah. <laughs> that's your work. That's your baby. That's your artwork. How would you put that out? And what if it doesn't represent your brand? Well, and of course, all the, the comments continue. But what would your response be to a photographer that says those kinds of things? I want to make sure that I'm able to 
serve as many different people as possible. And the Boston market is big, but not huge. And I don't want everyone's photos to look exactly the same. So I want the maximum number of people to want to work with me. And I don't want every single Boston influencer and blogger to have the exact same looking photos. So I feel like it was in my best interest as a business owner to let people do what they wanted to do and let it match their their vibe and stuff. And I I have a little clause in my contract for portrait sessions and stuff that says, you know, please don't do that. But okay. I also don't usually, I don't know. I'm not going to be the police over it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I feel like the point is to help people capture moments in their life. And if they think that that moment looks better with some kind of crazy grainy black and white filter on it from Instagram, then, you know, God bless. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, fair enough. So let's talk about this model. And first of all, let's start with the benefits of the subscription model. What are those from your perspective? Um, I have a really consistent income. I know exactly how much I'm going to be bringing in each month as a baseline based on how many monthly clients I'm serving at the time. Um, And then anything that I'm making above it is just kind of gravy, which is awesome because I, you know, my, my husband is a banker, so he is big into his budgeting. We have a multi-page spreadsheet of our personal budget that (laughs) I just once in a while look at and say like, Ooh, wow. So having a consistent baseline (laughs) is really helpful um, for us. And it took a lot of the stress off of me when I went full time, knowing that I will make X amount as a base every month. Yeah. Um, so that's awesome. Cool. My clients feel like coworkers because a lot of them, mm. I've been shooting with them now for eight or nine months. So I see them every month for eight or nine months. And um, it's just really fun. I love getting to have that deeper relationship with them. They're content creators. I'm a content creator. So I feel like our businesses um, and they're small business owners and I'm a small business owner. And so I feel like our, our goals overlap a lot. And so I feel like it's really turned into a super supportive community and that is just that's just the best and i think my number my third one was spending time with uh entrepreneurial minded people um yeah that's true you get to constantly play off of them yeah yeah and everyone has amazing ideas um so i feel like i'm really lucky in the fact that i get to walk into each and I say this to each client too, is that every single shoot we do is a collaboration between them and me. Um, they're just as much the art director as I am. Yeah. And so getting to, I feel like the challenge of hearing what someone says is their vision for the shoot and then working together to interpret that is really, it's a really rewarding process. And I feel like it also helps my clients feel like they have even more ownership over what we create together, which is a really cool feeling. Yeah, I, I, there's you know there's a certain amount of inspiration that that I get from even just these conversations with yourself and other guests that come on the show and that are sharing ideas and it's it, it's nice to have that bit of prodding if you will on a creative level through those conversations because it, it can be so easy to get kind of get stuck in the mundane right the day to day existence as an entrepreneur you're kind of doing a lot of the same things over and over again mm-hmm. and you want that little bit of spark uh, of creativity. The fact that you get to work with entrepreneurs nonstop in that realm is is pretty awesome. Yeah, it's really fun. Um, and I, my last thing was just that I get new creative challenges like every week. Every week we're dealing with, you know, shooting in someone's like tiny apartment in Boston. Yeah. And their kitchen doesn't have any light. So like, how do we fill that really quickly? Yeah. Or we're shooting out like, you know, in the streets and they have like five different outfits. So how do we like make those changes go quickly? And mm. how can I help them with all these different things? And how do we make every shoot feel unique but also true to their brand right so. i you you sold me like i'm watch <laughs> out chattanooga i'm gonna i'm gonna be a branding photographer now i mean seriously that that's all sounds super appealing but w- let's play a little devil's advocate let's look at the other side of things there are a few drawbacks uh, that you're going to share about this model what would those be it's a lot of work to turn around quickly hmm. so if i so right now i have 19 clients that i work with every single month wow so that means I have 19 shoots 
that need to get turned around two business days after I shoot them. So that can be, and of course there's always like once every like couple months, there's always like one time where like I have like five clients schedule shoot on the same day. And so then I'm back to back to back to back and that's fine. And then I have to edit all of it and you know, I still probably have other shoots the next day. So I think that's definitely one of the drawbacks is that um, there's a bit more pressure because I have to turn everything around pretty quickly. It's also kind of hard to raise or change your prices with clients that keep coming back and signing new contracts. Ah. Um, So since I've been doing this, Oh, I've probably been doing this, like this exact thing for about a year and a half. And I started low because I was new to the market. I, you know, everything. So I started super low. And then after doing, after like acquiring a couple of clients, I was like, oh yeah, really can't support myself (laughs) on this. So I kind of, you know, I would, as new people signed up, they would pay like a higher rate, whatever. And now I'm at the point where I kind of restructured it because I feel like after playing with it for a year, I knew what I wanted to do. And so Now I have to say, hey, so for 2020, if you are, whenever your contract expires in 2021, you then have to sign up for one of these new options. Okay. And so that's a little difficult too, to, because you have to have the conversation with each client to say, hey, like I get it. Like I, I need to raise my prices in order to, you know, live the life I want to live and provide excellent service. Um, but if that doesn't work for you, like, I'm like, sorry to see you go, but like, you have to be able to have that conversation with a lot of different people. And that's always an awkward conversation. So I feel like it's compared to wedding photography, it's a low price point for the amount of work I'm doing. Hmm. And so for me that, I I mean, I've found a way that make it work really well for me. But I think especially when a lot of my, cause most of my photographer friends are mostly wedding photographers. Um, and so just to kind of, I don't know, I, I feel like I end up probably doing, um, my hourly rate is probably quite a bit lower because I'm doing things with people who are starting businesses and don't have huge budgets and stuff like that. Yeah. So, um, there's definitely, um, you take a hit for getting to work with the cool creative people you want to work with on the price side of it. But I think it's, I definitely think it's worth it. But when you talk about the raising prices though, consistently, I think it's, I think it's great that you have the conversations. I mean, the idea of managing expectations proactively so that they understand on an annual basis, the price is going to increase. And I don't know if you like plan on an annual increase of an exact percentage amount that you can easily communicate with them and build into the contract or, that does it just kind of depend on on the year and th- the way the packages are changing? Yeah, I mean, it's only been like a year and a half, so okay. I haven't. I don't have like a ton of. Uh, I don't have a ton of experience with it yet. Um, but this will be my first. I've started reaching out to people because my first big change will be um, starting in January of 2021, okay. or whenever if someone has a six month contract that comes due in April. Sure. Then. I'm like, great. If you want to sign up for another six months, like that's fine. But this is what the deal is now. Okay. So, well, what I was going to get at with that too, though, is, I mean, if if you've created that expectation that enables you to continue to raise your prices and I know that it's going to naturally filter out certain clients, but then maybe that Mm -hmm. would just kind of naturally push you in the direction of some higher end clients that enable you to, to make more per hour at that point. Yeah. Would love that. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of, of, your how much it costs you though to run this business per hour turnaround times is kind of the last thing that I want to touch on. I'm curious when it comes to these subscription shoots, are there particular concepts or workflow concepts specifically that enable you to to turn around these shoots so quickly? I mean, that is you said two business days, is that right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's pretty quick to to be able to go through call, edit, and deliver. What is that workflow and ultimately what are the concepts that enable it? Yeah. So I feel like, I mean, I sort of touched on a little bit before the fact that I do a pretty quick, I do pretty quick editing. So I will, I'll, you know, get home from my shoot and I'll make sure that my, the shoot's downloaded onto my computer and so, or onto my external drive, like the night I get home. Yep. Um, and then I'll go through and like call and edit and send, but I do, a, I have a, pr- I'm pretty fast at it now and I don't do a, su- a lot of super in-depth edits, but I think probably the most helpful thing for me is I, when I, once I have the sketch, like the shoot booked, I then block off. I usually block off like two hours for every one hour shoot. 
for processing and editing and stuff. And so I'll block off two hours on my calendar within the next two business days for that shoot. So that when I'm looking at my calendar ahead of time, I'm not like, oh, I don't have anything going on on Friday. I can take three more shoots than when I have, you know, three or four different sessions due that day. And I'm going to need the full day to get all that done. Okay. So that's really helpful for me. So I don't overbook myself. And then also I don't shoot on Mondays or Thursdays. So anything that I'm shooting on the weekend, I have the full day Monday to get it together before it's due to the client on Tuesday. And then Thursdays, anything that I shoot on a Tuesday, Wednesday, I have the full day to get it all together before it's due on Thursday or Friday. And how long would you say it takes you to to edit a session after you shoot? I I think probably the like one and a half to two hours that I said before. It's pretty speedy. <laughs> and if if you, I mean, when when you're going to be processing these images, so simply minus presets, uh, I mean, I, this is an interesting concept to me. I know that when I was shooting weddings previously, uh, it was actually communicated to the clients that these are proof images. And mm. if they want retouching done for larger prints or otherwise, that, that we can do that, you know, kind of on an individual basis. But they understood that they were getting proof images. Now that didn't mean that I was giving them crap images that were underexposed yeah. and poorly cropped mm-hmm. and whatever else, but they also weren't perfected. I, I know that some photographers, I mean, I remember talking to one photographer in particular that was spending just insane amounts of time. I'm trying to remember like maybe two, three weeks or even more processing a a wedding because mm-hmm. they were being such perfectionists about it. And, you know, to each his own in the end, but I, I think about the amount of time that a lot of photographers waste as a result of not proactively managing expectations of their clients and feeling like they almost have to deliver these perfect images. And you know, photographers kind of get stuck in a cyclical mindset sometimes. And whereas you know this was good enough at this point in six months or a year, that's not going to be good enough. Now they have to you know take mm-hmm. it up another notch. All all while the clients don't actually care or notice these details that the, yeah. the photographers are working for. So. Is there something that you've done to manage the expectations of your clients so they understand that they're getting these so-called proof images that they can then further stylize themselves or have retouched if necessary? Yeah. I mean, we, that's part of like the initial phone call conversation that we have is kind of talking about what does it look like to like, what do you get after the shoot and then how do you use it? And so that is one of the, like one of the things that I say, I don't actually say to them, like, I'm not really doing a ton of editing on these because I have never had a complaint about it. So I'm not going to put that, I'm not going to put that out there to them (laughs) um, at the beginning. Well, you know, I think that's a great example of, of how you, you're framing it. You choose to frame it. And it's not that you're short selling them. You understand that they were going to take those images and, and as you were saying earlier, just apply a filter to them to, to make those images more consistent with their brand. It's not that you're doing a poor job because you're not spending hours and hours and hours in post-production. You just mm-hmm. understand how these images are going to be used and you understand yeah. it's not necessary for you to spend all that time editing. When well, you and also these photos aren't really getting printed ever either so the biggest that anyone's ever going to see them probably is like a hero space on a website yeah so it's also one of those things where i feel like for a portrait client for i do like a couple um like little mini elopements and like senior sessions and stuff throughout the year too for those i'll take the time to go through and like do a deep deep edit on all of those because I know there's a chance that they're going to end up on someone's wall um, in a big, big way. And you'll be able to see whatever small thing that you wouldn't um, be able to catch if you're scrolling by on Instagram. But for these ones, I keep it pretty, pretty light and pretty natural. So they can, whatever they want to, whatever edits they want to make to them um, will pop and (laughs) Sure. Well, (laughs) that, that makes sense. And I think it's a a fascinating way to go about managing that post-production stream. And especially if photographers are going to do it themselves, why complicate it any further? Uh, it, that's at least my thought process anyway, at least on a very basic level. But nonetheless, yeah. uh, your your perspective is, I think, super helpful for our listeners on multiple levels. I really appreciate you making time um, sharing the way that you've approached this, this business model, which uh, I think could be, could lend itself to really great opportunity for photographers in various markets, especially as branding photography continues to become more popular, um, largely due to social media, that photographers Mm -hmm. consider a model like this and and all its advantages. uh, I think it's really wonderful. So thank you for sharing it with us. Absolutely. And for those of you listening in, make sure, again, that you take advantage of the show notes, bookapodcast.com. We'll link to Caroline's 
website, which again is carolinethephotographer.co. And Caroline, your Instagram account as well? It is just Caroline the Photographer. Perfect. We'll link to that in the show notes as well. You can check out Caroline's work there. Make sure you give her a follow and a shout out and keep in touch, everybody. Don't hesitate to, to shoot us an email if you have any thoughts, suggestions uh, about not only the content we're producing, but content that you'd like to see or hear. Just shoot an email to Nathan at bocapodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. And thanks again, Caroline, for hanging out with all of us. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much, photographers, for listening to the Boca Podcast. Will you let us know what you thought of the show by leaving a review of the podcast in the Apple Podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is nathan at bocapodcast.com. Make sure to visit our sponsors, photographersedit.com, custom photo editing for the professional photographer, and milu.com, that's M-I-I-L-U.com, the simplest way to create and manage timelines and shot lists for the events you're photographing.